So welcome to Treatment Talk, Genetics and Bladder Cancer Treatments. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Advocacy at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Today's program is sponsored by Bristol-Myers Squibb, the EMD Serono Pfizer Partnership, Merck, and Urogen. We often hear that many patients have no known exposure risk factors to bladder cancer, such as smoking, and they wonder how they develop bladder cancer. And should they be worried about their siblings or their children being diagnosed at some point? Beacon is really pleased to welcome Dr. Guru Sampavde, Director of GU Oncology at Advent Health Cancer Institute in Florida, Dr. Marianne Dubard Galt, Director of the Cancer Genetic Service at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance in Washington, and also delighted to have the Director of Bladder Cancer Research at Weill Cornell University, Dr. Peshoy Faltis, with our patient advocates, Melanie Pepin and Ken Deutsch on our treatment talk program. Today's program, our presenters will share the clinically significant genetic changes known as germline variants that exist in some bladder cancer patients, but not all. And our patient advocates are going to share their experience with finding out about their own germline variants. So Dr. Sampavde and Dr. Faltas, welcome. You both are doing a lot of research on what is known as germline variants in bladder cancer. So we're really looking forward to finding out what some of the most common genetic alterations are in the disease and how they impact the treatment for bladder cancer. So Dr. Sampate, I know you had some slides. So if you wanna share your screen, you can help explain it with your slides first and then we'll let Dr. Faltas add any comments at the end. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for the invitation to um, give a brief lecture on the genetics of bladder cancer. So briefly, we're gonna be talking about inherited mutations uh, in this talk. So we're not really uh, uh, talking about mutations found on profiling and you know studying the tumor tissue itself. I'm at the Advent Health Cancer Institute in Orlando. These are my disclosures. So there are some broad indications for germline evaluation to see if the patient has any mutations they were born with that makes them susceptible to cancer. And this is, of course, young age of cancer diagnosis. When you suspect this, if you have a family history of cancer, especially in a first degree relative, if you have multiple or prior cancers, if you have bilateral cancers, or if you have some suspicious DNA mutations in the cancer cell itself, when you're studying that cancer uh, biopsy specimen. And of course you do this because you wanna see if you can um, uh, help with risk reducing surgery, chemo prevention, cancer surveillance, and cascade testing in other people in the family if a patient has a mutation that might increase the risk of cancer. So there are some specific indications for germline evaluation of patients to see if they were born with certain mutations that lead to cancer. So this includes patients who are younger with colon or uterine cancer, or younger breast cancer patients. Now we do it in metastatic prostate cancer patients and localized high-risk, high gleason high score prostate cancer because there are therapeutic implications with PARP inhibition treatment. Localized uh, breast cancer that is now eligible for adjuvant Olaparib, a PARP inhibitor, where it's approved in patients with germline alterations. And also any malignancy where you have something called MSI high or a deficient mismatch repair, uh, you want to uh, look at whether these patients have a germline alteration um, because some of these uh, syndromes, especially the Lynch syndrome, is associated with MSI high or deficiency in mismatch repair. Also, in certain cancers, germline testing of patients is uh, done in any stage of cancer with male breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, ovarian cancer, <clears throat> pancreatic cancer, and perhaps uh, colorectal cancer is now the emerging cancer where we are thinking of doing it in everybody, regardless of stage. Now, just a little bit of background on bladder cancer. We see approximately 80,000 new cases a year in the US. There is a strong environmental influence. We know about cigarette smoking, dyes, and paint exposure that increases the risk of bladder cancer. It's an older person's disease. The median age is uh, almost 70 years. There is a male predominance of the disease. Approximately 70% are male. We don't really understand 
why, but um, this is a field for study. Approximately three quarters of patients have non-muscle invasive disease, so still not invading the muscle deeper layer of the bladder or beyond. And we know that once it invades the muscle, it becomes very aggressive. You can have microscopic distant disease, and this is uh, difficult to cure once it metastasizes and it becomes visible on scans or clinically, then you are uh, really facing uh, mostly incurable disease, unfortunately. There is not an established role for screening and chemo prevention through medic medical therapy to prevent cancer at the moment in, uh, in all patients with bladder cancer. So we have known that there is a familial aggregation of bladder cancer. When you see historically back in the 1960s, we've had case reports and series which uh, described families with a concentration of bladder cancer in several people in the same family. So there seem to be a genetic and environmental interaction. In most cancers, there we think there is an interaction, of course, of something the patient was born with and interaction with something in the environment. For example, cigarette smoking could be that risk. There is also, we know that um, there would be a role for surveillance of high-risk patients and prevention of known carcinogens. So if you know somebody is at high risk because they were born with a mutation, you might wanna be um, um, surveil them and keep a closer eye on them. And also in high-risk relatives of cancer-affected patients, you wanna keep a closer eye on them. Now, one study found that familial clustering is rare. Now, one of the problems is there might be under-reporting of familial clustering because it was felt that if uh, many people in the same family develop cancer, it might be because they share the same exposure. So if somebody smokes in the family, for example, everybody in the family is exposed to cigarette smoking. Is it because of that? Or is it because they were born with a certain mutation that led to an increased risk of bladder cancer? Or were they born with some, some mutations and some genes that slows down the metabolism of some toxins and therefore increases the risk of cancer? So not directly causing cancer, but slowing down the metabolism of certain toxins. So we found in Dana-Farber, that there was a 4.3% incidence of familial bladder cancer, defined as bladder cancer in a person and one more first degree relative with bladder cancer. And we found interestingly, there was no association with age. So really it was not like older patients had a higher risk of a family history of bladder cancer in a first degree relative, but the shared environmental risk was unclear in the study. Now, what we know interestingly is that a family history of bladder cancer and smoking in the person cooperate to increase the risk of bladder cancer. So interestingly, in this study, those who smoked and had a positive family history had a much higher risk of bladder cancer. And especially those who smoked and had a family member diagnosed at a young age, that really increased the risk 6.89 fold as you see here. So really it looked like family history of bladder cancer uh, and smoking, cigarette smoking, cooperate to increase uh, exponentially the risk of uh, bladder cancer, really suggesting that smoking is never good, but smoking, especially with the history of bladder cancer in the family is even much worse. So Lynch syndrome is a syndrome, it's a hereditary predisposition syndrome with certain mutations I show you here that patients are born with. And we know that this is a syndrome well known to be associated with colon cancer. However, we also know that this is associated with bladder and urinary tract, upper tract, urinary tract cancer. So approximately 7.5% of men and 1% of women with um, Lynch syndrome developed um, urinary tract cancer over a long period of time by age 70. So really the authors here suggested that based on these findings, patients um, who have a known Lynch syndrome especially the MSH2 gene, uh, perhaps you should consider surveillance from age 40 and up uh, every one to two years. There is a different study here also that looked at several Lynch syndrome families and found an approximately 7% uh, risk of uh, urinary tract cancer by age 70. Now 7%, uh, just to put it in perspective, um, it's higher than um, baseline of course, but it's not as high as the penetrance of Lynch syndrome for colon cancer. So if you have Lynch syndrome, the risk of colon cancer is perhaps approximately 50%, while uh, bladder cancer is much lower, 7%. So really the penetrance is not high, uh, fortunately, but there is clearly an association with uh, urinary tract cancer.
So what is the hereditary component of urothelial carcinoma? This is essentially a, the most common cell type of uh, cancer of the urinary tract. We know in a large study that I show you here, the heritability of cancer overall, what is the hereditary component of cancer? Approximately 33%. And as you can see here, bladder cancer is right there in the middle of that range. So really the heritability of bladder cancer is about average when you compare across different cancers. So it's not at the highest. You see here prostate cancer is much higher, 57% heritability, for example. Now, this is a study that uh, at Memorial Stone Kettering looked at patients uh, who were unselected. So any uro urinary tract cancer patients, uh, urothelial carcinoma patients were selected, uh, close to 600 patients. And they found that 14% of patients had one of these DNA damage repair gene mutations. You see here some of the Lynch genes are in there. So the BRCA genes are in there, well known to be associated with breast cancer. And what was found was that younger age was enriched uh, for these uh, alterations. So really, um, again, suggesting that perhaps in younger age patients, you should have a lower threshold to test for germline mutations that uh, these patients may have been born with. This is a different study we did at Dana-Farber, which is uh, from a one commercial company and more than a thousand patients. This was a somewhat more selected uh, group. So we sent patients uh, blood for germline testing if we think they're at high risk for uh, some uh, inherited gene mutation. So this was somewhat more selected, somewhat younger population, 58 years. So you can see here, 24% of patients had a pathogenic mutation they were born with and 18.6% of them uh, overall had an actionable, so-called actionable uh, mutation. Again, enriched for some of the Lynch genes and the BRCA genes. Now, there's a recent study that looked at patients, specifically patients who had non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, so cancer that was not yet invading the muscle and beyond. The interesting finding here, this was at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, New York, was that patients with high-grade uh, non-muscle invasive cancer uh, were enriched for germline mutations, 13.5%, while the low-grade patients did not have this mutation. So this is somewhat interesting, suggesting some association of um, grade, higher grade, non-muscle invasive disease with these mutations. So as you know, we are doing tumor tissue testing a lot these days to select patients for certain drugs based on mutation found in the tumor. So not germline, not what you were born with, but in the tumor. So one of the questions that arises is, um, uh, should you do germline testing if you find certain mutations in the tumor? So uh, in fact, the NCCN suggests that in patients who have certain mutations that would be high risk if they were germline, for example, the Lynch genes, the BRCA genes, when you find them in the tumor, should you be doing a germline test of the patient's blood or um, saliva to see if they were born with some of these mutations. So this is what the NCCN suggests, uh, at least to consider this in patients who have these high risk mutations in the tumor itself. And in fact, there is a different study here that found that tumor sequencing is actually pretty good at catching germline mutations, but it does not catch everything. So really the author suggests that really to capture all the patients with germline mutations, yeah, you would have to do a germline testing in um, everybody to be um, to um, and not be uh, not do it as a reflex based on tumor testing. So this is one direction the uh, research and the body of research is going is to do universal testing in everybody, regardless of what mutation is in the tumor. Uh, one other question that arises is we are doing circulating tumor DNA testing. So this is DNA in circulating freely in the plasma in the blood, not in the blood cells. So when we do this, we're looking at really, we're trying to look at whether the patient has uh, mutations in the tumor that are detected in the blood. So it turns out that if you have a high threshold and you try to catch uh, these mutations with a high, so-called high allele fraction, present in a high fraction, then you can actually catch um, hereditary DNA mutations that the patients may be born with, even in circulating tumor DNA. So you should pay attention to what mutations are seen in the allele fraction even in the circulating tumor DNA, which we do usually just to look for mutations uh, as a reflection of mutations in the tumor itself. So uh, the universal germline testing, 
is um, uh, emerging. We know that when you look at, across different studies, when you just test everybody with uh, any solid tumor, you see uh, between five and 15% of patients having some uh, germline mutation that is uh, relevant. And in fact, many of these have therapeutic implications. We know that many of these drugs here are approved based on germline mutations in these BRCA genes, uh, the MSI high tumors with the deficiency in mismatch repair. So as you can see here, several therapeutic implications based on germline mutations. And in fact, in bladder cancer, there's a study that looked at rucaparib, a PARP inhibitor in patients with metastatic cancer as a uh, maintenance following chemotherapy setting. And it turns out that patients with either tumor or germline mutations, most of them had uh, pretty much tumor actually, but germline mutations were allowed on this study. There was an improvement in outcomes in patients with a DNA damage repair mutation at the tumor level of the germline. So I'll just give you a quickly a summary conclusion slide. So clinically significant germline variants found in mostly DNA damage repair genes are found in approximately 15% of uh, all patients with uh, urothelial carcinoma, but there is not a single dominant gene with the high penetrance that causes cancer. As I said, Lynch syndrome, only 7% penetrance. So we should really um, use general prudent principles to refer patients for germline testing, younger patients, other primaries, bilaterality, um, especially non-smokers with cancer. There is no known environmental exposure, really should have a low threshold to test these patients. If you have uh, done tumor profiling, you should consider germline analysis uh, especially if you see uh, a mutation that is uh, of, of significant relevance if it's present at the germline, for example, a BRCA gene or a Lynch gene found in the tumor testing. Uh, and some of these variants in mutations, of course, could guide therapy on trials and trigger cascade test testing, the so-called cascade testing of other people in the family, uh, especially the first degree relatives if the patient has one of these mutations. Family history is insensitive. Family history is something that patients don't usually recall very well occasionally, and actually quite commonly, upper urinary tract cancer is uh, frequently misrepresented as kidney cancer, which is it's not, it's a urinary tract cancer. So that is a, a frequent source of uh, confusion for family history. And surveillance, uh, although it's not done in everybody, surveillance in Lynch syndrome patients starting in the mid 30s to 40, um, should be considered, and patients with these germline mutations, um, especially in syndrome, should, of course, uh, stop smoking you know, because of the cooperation of an environmental insult and a germline alteration. And studies should really focus on underrepresented populations. All of these germline studies that I showed you, they were really enriched for uh, Caucasian um, population, so there was not much uh, for Asian population or African-American population. And then finally, the momentum for universal germline genetic testing of all patients with advanced solid tumors is building. Um, and uh, because this can capture alterations uh, that may not be, will not be always captured on tumor testing. So this is where the field is going, but this needs further thought and further study. With that, I end it uh, in my talk here. Sorry, I'm just trying to <clears throat> get my computer off of mute. So Dr. Faltis, I know you're doing a lot of research. Do you have any comments to add about some of the work that you're working on in this particular germline area? Thank you, Stephanie. So it, it's always a, Dr. Sampavde is always a very hard act to follow because uh, I think <laughs> he's covered all the important points. Uh, just a couple, of, a couple of points that uh, he's already mentioned that I would like to uh, touch on briefly. Uh, so I think the family history uh, is actually quite an important point. And this is an example, uh, this whole topic of germline mutations of bladder cancer is an example of a topic that the more we ask about family history and the more we look for these mutations, the more we find them. Uh, and as clinicians, uh, we haven't necessarily been trained as, as, as genitourinary medical oncologists treating bladder cancer, to be very specific. We don't, so far, we haven't generally been uh, necessarily focused on the family history because up until now, we didn't, up until the last few years, most of us haven't really known that uh, before this research came about that uh, research from our group, Dr. Sampavta's group, Dr. Carla's group, and many others, 
uh, that that these uh, germline mutations are actually prevalent in patients with bladder cancer. And we're still debating what uh, really to do about them, what are the implications therapeutically, uh, implications for cascade testing, and, and so on and so forth. And I know we're going to discuss that today uh, with Dr. Dubar. So I think these are important points. Uh, just to summarize this point, I think it's we're all on a mission here to increase awareness of the high prevalence, relatively high prevalence of these alterations. And it's very important to ask because uh, although I agree with Dr. Sampavdi, the history is in, an insensitive tool, but uh, sometimes also very important in terms of uh, raising the, the red flags or, or the suspicion for testing. Uh, the second point I think that uh, Dr. Sampavdi also touched on is that most of our knowledge about these germline mutations is coming from Caucasian patients. And specifically when it comes down to a, a point related to variants of unknown significance, uh, which are essentially a classification of these alterations that could come back. Uh, so yes, there is an alteration on genetic testing or a mutation, but we don't know its clinical significance. And these VUSs or variants of unknown significance are, signi are a lot more prevalent in non-Caucasian patients, the patients from other diverse ancestries, mostly because we really haven't been uh, studying these patient populations in the past. And we're working to correct this in our own research, uh, but that's an area that uh, I think we all need to be aware of and to continue to work on, both to study these variants of unknown significance and un uh, reclassify them to try to understand really what their clinical significance is for patients from all ancestries. I'll stop there. Yeah, that's, you guys are doing some amazing work and I know that the future is going to look brighter because you're digging deeper into so many of these things. So 